Welcome to this webinar, Bangap Subnida. My name is Nicola Bock. I'm head of events at Agora Energiewende. Today's event, Design the Future, pardon, today's event, Carbon Neutral Industry, marks the first of a series of events which is organized by the Embassy of the Republic of Korea. And the series is called Design the Future. There will be other topics covered um, in the next weeks or months, probably. And today we're starting with carbon neutral industry. And we are very delighted that the embassy invited Agora Industry, which is a sub-brand of Agora Energiewende, to co-host this event with the embassy today. Um, to discuss not only the challenges, but also the opportunities that um, Korea, Germany, and other countries transitioning to climate neutral industry um, are facing. Now, what's on the agenda for today for the next 105 minutes? We do have an hour and 45 minutes. We have the opening remark by the ambassador, Her Excellency, Dr. Hyun Ok Cho. And afterwards, we will have two presentations on transitioning to carbon neutral industry, one from the Korean point of view and one from a more European um, perspective, also focusing on the role of climate alliances. Um, after the two presentation, we have three presenters, two presentations. Um, we are looking forward to a panel discussion between two representatives from industry-related Korean research institutes. And then, as mentioned before, we should have another 20 minutes left for a Q&A session where we would like to address the questions of our dear audience. And I would now like to hand over the microphone to the ambassador, Her Excellency, um, the floor is yours. Can I go? Yes, everyone, I'm the ambassador of the pandemic. I'm the ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the Federal Republic of Germany. After the global pandemic, the recent crisis in Ukraine has hit the global economy hard. However, responding to climate change is also a very important issue that can guarantee uh, the security of our societies and the economy, which is why the importance of climate action cannot be overemphasized. In the midst of severe global warming and climate crisis, the Republic of Korea made the 2050 Carbon Neutrality Declaration and we are carrying it out. The Korean government enhanced the 2030 nationally determined contributions on greenhouse gas emissions reductions and the Framework Act on Carbon Neutrality and Green Growth, which aims to make the transition toward carbon neutrality society will go into effect on March 25th. However, achieving carbon neutrality requires a fundamental transformation of our society and economic structure, which is why it's not an easy task. In particular, for countries with manufacturing industry and export-oriented industrial structures, such as Republic of Korea and Germany, the situation is even more difficult. However, I believe that such difficulties highlight the issue of carbon neutrality even more, which goes beyond the realm of climate and environmental policies, and is directly related to corporate and industrial competitiveness and the creation of new growth engines, all of which make carbon neutrality a very important economic issue, and such awareness is critical. Germany's new coalition government, which took power last year, a newly created Ministry of Economy and Climate Protection and is fast implementing the transformation in the energy and diverse industrial sectors, which offer substantial ramifications. Last week, the presidential election took place in Korea as well, and Korea's new government will be inaugurated in May this year and is expected to make the utmost effort as well, uh, without any hesitance, to materialize carbon neutrality into a reality. In the meantime, this will be made possible when Korea's climate policies are in harmony with realities of our industries and trade. Therefore, the Embassy of Korea in Germany selected carbon neutrality in industrial sectors as our main theme, um, which is part of Korea-Germany dialogue series. I sincerely hope that this webinar will serve as a platform where we can examine the challenges and opportunities faced by Korea and German industries and achieve all of our three goals, including the national response to climate change and the development of domestic industries and economies and climate 
cooperation between the two countries. I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt appreciation to Agora Energy Fende, which is hosting this webinar. And I also thank Professor Cho Yong Song, who will be moderator, as well as other experts from the two countries. I'm looking forward to your highly respected opinions and professional insight. In conclusion, I sincerely hope that today's event will provide an important starting point for all of us to widen our mutual understanding between the two countries so that we can further expand the bilateral climate cooperation into more various areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your um, kind works and opening remarks, um, Her Excellency. And uh, I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to um, learn a lot about um, the challenges and opportunity on both sides, um, but also on the European and global level. And without further ado, I would now like to introduce the moderator, Professor Jung Sung Cho, to you. He is um, at the Korea University and used to be the president of Korea Energy Economic Institute, KEEI, in the past. And um, Professor Cho, uh, you can now switch on your camera. So I can hand over the virtual microphone to you and uh, I'm looking forward to the next one hour and a half and this webinar. Thank you, Nicola, and thank you, Ambassador. Uh, this is Yong Song Cho. Before we start for the seminar, I would like to make some point about the carbon utility in industry sector in Korean. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, as you all know, the Republic of Korea and Germany have an export oriented industrial structure that is heavily focused on manufacturing. And within the industrial sector, as of 2019, the portion of manufacturing accounts for 28% in Korea and 21% in Germany. And the representative industries that generate substantial amounts of greenhouse gas, such as steel, metal, casting, account for 4.1% in Korea and 2.6% in Germany. And both figures are very high in both countries relative to other countries. In particular, in case of Korea, steel, petrochemical, cement, and oil, and these four industries generate 76% of the entire greenhouse gas emissions in industrial sectors in Korea. According to a report published by the Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade, KIET, in 2017, the factors that will increase the greenhouse gas emissions in industrial sectors in Korea were categorized and analyzed into three groups, including production increase, and two, exacerbation of energy efficiency, and third, the use of fossil fuels that emit too much greenhouse gas, um, such as coal. And carbon dioxide emissions have been on the rise continuously, but due to the outbreak of COVID-19 and the economic slowdown, the CO2 emissions decreased for the first time for two consecutive years in 2019 and 2020. However, with the economic recovery, along with the increased consumption of energy, the greenhouse gas emission, which has been on the decline, is going back up again. And we are concerned about the so-called rebound effect. To achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 and to accomplish Korea's NDC in 2030, greenhouse gas emissions in industrial sectors must be reduced dramatically. And to achieve this goal in the short term, increasing energy consumption rate, which is spiking along with economic recovery, must be decreased. In the mid to long term, decoupling of economic growth and greenhouse gas emissions must occur. And for this to happen, um, technological progress and energy transition and the enhancement of energy efficiency must take place, which is more important than anything else. In particular, it's imperative to come up with tailor-made greenhouse gas reduction measures and support that reflect the characteristics and conditions of each industry. Um, for instance, direct emission of greenhouse gas generated from the use of fossil fuel take up large portions of emissions in steel industry, which is about 79%, as well as in petrochemical industry, which is about 64%. On the other hand, and industries that emit the most amount of greenhouse gas in industrial processes include um, cement, which is about 67%. Also, the indirect greenhouse gas emissions, such as electricity use, account for most emissions in um, semiconductor industry, which is about 
Therefore, these characteristics must be taken into account when devising effective reduction measures for each industry, and we have to find the most effective reduction measures for each industry. So in light of this, today's seminar is expected to generate very opportune and beneficial ramifications. Today's seminar will consist of three presentations, which will be delivered by Dr. Sang Jun Lee from Korea Energy Economics Institute, as well as two experts from Agora Industry, which will be followed by a discussion session uh, featuring two Korean experts. So without further ado, let us commence our seminar in earnest. First, Dr. Lee will be presenting. Please limit your presentation within 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Share my uh, slide first. Okay, good time, Morgan. My name is Sang Jun Lee. Good, good morning, Your Excellency's distinguished guest. My name is Sang Jun Lee. I'm the team leader of Climate Policy Research Team at the Korea Energy Economics Institute. So I introduce myself in German. Well, first of all, I would like to thank all of you. And first of all, it is my great honor to have this opportunity to deliver my presentation for this one. Industry, which is hosted by the Embassy of the Republic of Korea in Germany and Agora Industry. And last year, in the process of establishing Korea's 2050 carbon neutrality scenario, I was in charge of the industrial sector division. And as I served as an expert member of the economic and industrial division of Korea's presidential 2050 carbon neutrality commission, I have been thinking much about continuously um, how to devise good policies to achieve carbon neutrality in industrial sectors in Korea. I'm still, still thinking much about that. And in the process of doing it, I often refer to the cases of the European Union, which is leading carbon um, neutral policies. And I'm especially interested in the case of Germany, which is heavily focused on manufacturing sector. That's quite strong, just like Korea. Therefore, I believe that this webinar is a very precious opportunity for all of us. And today, my presentation's main theme is about the direction of Korea's key policies for transitioning to carbon neutrality in the industrial sector. Well, first of all, let's take a brief look at the current status of greenhouse gas emissions in Korea. As of 2018, Korea's total GHG emissions is about 728 million tons of CO2 equivalent. As is shown in the table on the left, Korea's greenhouse gas emissions have been on the rise continuously since the 1990s, when official data began to be collected, and especially up until uh, 2010, it tended to rise dramatically. But after 2010, which is relatively recent, you can notice that the increased rate has sub subsided slightly. And although it's not shown in the graphs here, Korea's greenhouse gas emissions have decreased continuously in 2019 and 2020 consecutively. As is shown on the right-hand side, the intensity of greenhouse gas emissions has improved continuously, and the decoupling trend between economic growth and greenhouse gas emissions has been accelerated, which in turn leads to the prediction um, that Korea's greenhouse gas emissions will be decreased um, gradually. However, when the economic slowdown caused by the pandemic, which began in 2020, is taken into account, it's difficult to conclude that um, Korea's GHG emissions are decreasing in earnest, which is why our climate policies are important going forward. And we can't conclude that our emissions are going down yet. And GHG emission reduction in industrial sectors will be especially important for Korea going forward. And this chart shows the growth rate of added value of Korea's industrial sector and the growth rate of Korea's GHG emissions. As you can see, the two variables are almost coupled here, meaning that they go together which goes to show that Korea's greenhouse gas emission increase was the result of the growth of the industrial sector to a large extent. So when industrial sector grew, emissions increased as well. This chart is emphasizing the fact that in materializing carbon neutrality in Korea, turning Korea's industrial sector carbon neutral is really important. 
And this time, let me briefly introduce how Korea's discourse on carbon neutrality has unfolded. It was discussed in the past as well, but the discourse on Korea's carbon neutrality began in earnest in 2020 under the COVID-19 crisis with the launch of Korea's um, Green New Deal policy. And as COVID-19 exacerbated, Korea also tried to overcome this crisis, including the economic fallout through Korea's Green New Deal policy. So government policies were devised and carbon neutrality was mentioned here. And Korea's carbon neutrality objective became a concrete goal in October 2020 with President Moon Jae-in's declaration of 2050 carbon neutrality in October 20. As achieving carbon neutrality in 2050 became Korea's official goal, it emerged as the key agenda of the Korean government. And afterward, subsequent plans were made one after another. Now let me explain the policies that are more rela related to the, the industrial sectors. Um, the 2050 carbon neutrality strategy announced in December 2020 is a plan that stipulates the policy direction in pursuing carbon neutrality in Korea. And after that 2050 carbon neutrality scenario was announced in October 2021 and sectoral 2050 carbon neutrality vision and strategies was announced in December 2021, which covers strategies to make Korea's industrial sectors carbon neutral. And both of them provide a concrete um, policy direction. And this system looks similar to the EU's plans and systems as the EU announced its European Green Deal. And through industrial strategies, EU has made its industrial sector strategies um, a more concrete gradually. So it's, we have a similar system. So Korea also had Korea's Green Deal and we had more concrete policies that were devised afterwards. And this slide shows Korea's New Deal system uh, which was announced for the first time. And as you can see, Korean New Deal has two main pillars, uh, Digital New Deal on the left and Green New Deal on the right, and creating a strong social safety net is its third main factor. So it has three pillars. As is shown here, in order to overcome the COVID-19 crisis, investment is focused on digital and green areas, and it shows that the will of the government to protect the vulnerable class and recovered economy. So in this stage, Green New Deal is included as its main pillar, but it's mostly focused on strengthening the existing policies, such as low carbon energy transition. So as is shown in these graphs, the two big things are included, yes? But carbon neutral policy direction was not completely um, included here in this stage yet. And carbon neutrality will become its main agenda a bit later. So in this stage, it's just being discussed roughly. And carbon neutrality became Korea's main policy agenda with President Moon Jae-in's declaration of carbon neutrality 2050 during his speech at Korea's National Assembly in October 2020 to propose the government's budget for 2021. And since then, the presidential 2050 carbon neutrality commission was launched in May 2021, uh, which deliberates on major policies related to carbon neutrality. And the Framework Act on Carbon Neutrality and Green Growth was passed by the National Assembly in August. And with this, the Republic of Korea became the 14th country in the world to legislate carbon neutrality. In case of Korea, right after carbon neutrality emerged as a full-fledged national agenda, related policies were devised in a very rapid pace, which characterizes our carbon neutral policies. And this was made possible um, because Korea is such a dynamic country. The Bali Bali, we, we do everything very quickly. Next slide sums up Korea's 2050 carbon neutral strategies, which was announced in December 2020. And um, this strategy holds its significance in that it shows the overall direction towards carbon neutrality on the national level. But it is not a special plan for the industrial sector yet. So no specialization yet. However, it is worth noting because it shows a similar direction as the industrial sector strategies that would emerge later. And the strategy is often called three, pl three plus one strategy, which is a structure that offers a certain direction in implementing carbon neutral policies. So first low carbon economy transition must be made. And second, low carbon industries must be developed, both of which consist 
of consists as its main system. And then third, inclusive transition must occur as well, which means that the people, class, regions, jobs, etc., that are bound to be reduced or damaged in the process of low carbon transition, uh, these must be adequately addressed in implementing carbon neutral policies. So inclusive transition is just as important. And the final one here is the policy framework. The final part is related to creating a foundation to support the aforementioned these three strategies. And it aims to strengthen the institutional foundation, such as carbon pricing system, R&D, and financing, et cetera. In the next two slides, I'll explain the parts that are highly related to the industrial sectors in Korea. So first of all, in the industrial sectors in Korea, the process of innovation, transforming carbon intensive industrial structure into low carbon industrial structure is uh, more important than anything else. And this strategic direction will be more specified in vision and strategy on industrial transformation for carbon neutrality, which will be explained later. And in the process of transforming Korea's industrial structure towards low carbon structure, no matter how hard we try, there will be some industries that are bound to be reduced, relatively speaking. In light of this, fostering new growth engines will be an important task for all countries, not just Korea. And this is why laying the foundation for new industries by nurturing low carbon new industries and climate related industries uh, must be addressed as an important issue. And for instance, secondary battery and green hydrogen and others are the industries that Korea is paying keen attention to. And regarding climate related industries, um, green service and CCUS are offered as examples. And this slide shows the industrial sector of Korea's 2050 carbon neutrality scenario announced in October 2021 as these graphs and tables. Carbon neutrality scenario provides a blueprint for major means of implementing Korea's carbon neutrality policies and is scheduled to be revised and complemented as carbon neutral technologies and policies are diversified going forward. So it will change going forward. And as is shown on the left-hand side in the industrial sector by 2050, the use of fossil fuels will be radically reduced while electricity, renewables, and hydrogen will become the main source of energy according to this analysis. And as a result, as is shown on the right-hand side, greenhouse gas emissions in the industrial sectors will be reduced from about 260.5 million tons down to 51.1 million tons in 2050. And the greenhouse gas emissions in the industrial sector still remain a bit due to some of the emissions generated from the um, industrial processes and cement production, which are practically impossible to reduce. However, the residual um, emissions will be offset by um, utilizing carbon capture, utilization and storage technology, CCUS, or absorbed by others, uh, which will result in net zero. So this slide shows your figures excluding CCUS technologies. So if we use the technologies, we will be able to reach net zero more easily. And the core technological means of materializing carbon neutrality in the industrial sectors are focused on the hard to abate industries. Well, as you all know very well already for hard to abate industries, it's difficult to achieve carbon neutrality because the current production processes are directly combined with using fossil fuels or raw materials. And thus without fundamental innovation of its production processes, carbon neutrality becomes a very difficult goal to accomplish. Therefore innovation in hard to abate industries would have to play the most pivotal role in implementing carbon neutrality in industrial sectors in Korea. Um, prime examples include hydrogen reduction technology in steel industry and raw materials and fuel conversion technology for petrochemical and cement industries, which will allow them to use eco-friendly raw materials and fuels. So such technologies must be developed and large scale investment will be required as well. And at the same time, an energy system that can supply clean sources of energy, such as green hydrogen in a stable manner uh, must be put in place as well. 
in other industries, um, excluding the hard to abate industries, the core means of implementing carbon neutrality is electrification. Well, literally, as electricity will replace the consumption of existing fossil fuels, the electricity consumption in the industrial sectors is expected to double approximately in 2050 compared to 2018. And electrification is essential in implementing carbon neutrality, but to prevent a sudden spike in electricity demand, continuous efforts to enhance energy efficiency must be made as well simultaneously. And for some industries where electrification is impossible, other alternatives such as hydrogen or bioenergy will be needed. And emissions and industrial processes are mainly generated from Korea's core competitive industries, such as semiconductors, display, elect electrics and electronics, automobiles, etc. So there are factors for increase going forward. To address this issue and to achieve the goal of carbon neutrality, substitute materials with low global warming potential should be developed and innovation in many areas, including emission control technology will be required. And Korea is considering these areas as top priorities in carbon neutrality, our research and development. And finally, I will touch upon the carbon neutrality vision and strategy for industry and energy. This was announced in December 2021, concurrently with carbon neutrality strategy for energy sector. And the Korean government devised strategies for energy sector and industrial sectors, respectively, but the announcement was made in converged manner. I think that this is very meaningful because it goes to show that in implementing carbon neutrality, the industrial sector alone cannot achieve the goal, but converged efforts along with the energy sector must create synergistic effects together. So industrial transformation strategy for carbon neutrality through the transition towards a low carbon economy aims to make the Republic of Korea uh, the fourth largest export powerhouse. And once again, this strategy, the industrial transformation strategy for carbon neutrality. Uh, so with this vision, low carbon and eco-friendly products will become uh, the mainstream products and will become a major player. And this vision offers five main strategies as its main policy. And first, the transformation toward the low carbon industrial structure stipulates to achieve carbon neutrality and the Korean government will provide unsparing support. And building carbon neutral ecosystem is also very important. And fostering carbon neutral new industries is also very important. So I can't give you detailed information about everything. So I will give you just brief explanation about what it means. So first is the uh, transformation towards a low carbon industrial structure stipulates that um, to achieve carbon neutrality, Korean government will provide unsparing support, such as proactive R&D investment, tax incentives, and policy financing. And the second one is building a carbon neutral ecosystem, stipulating that a stable clean energy support supply system must be established along with markets that reflect carbon values and carbon neutral supply chain. And the third one is um, fostering carbon neutral new industries, and it stipulates that eco-friendly infrastructure um, and low carbon materials, parts and equipment industries and green engineering, all of them must be fostered, um, for instance. And fourth, um, in the process of implementing carbon neutrality, the value of achieving fair transition is emphasized. In particular, for a small and medium-sized enterprises or traditional manufacturing industries that are hard to make the transition towards carbon neutrality, assistance must be provided, will be provided for a preemptive low carbon transformation and business innovation. And in addition, by nurturing green industries in provincial regions, the foundation for balanced development among different regions will be solidified, which is a clear policy direction expressed here. And finally, regarding laws and regulations, the Special Act on Industrial Transformation to Carbon Neutrality is uh, provided as an important institutional basis. And moreover, through an agile system that can complement policies, creating a policy environment that can faithfully reflect the demands of the industrial sectors is offered as a core task. 
So if you take a look at this overall structure of the strategy, it demonstrates that Korea established a structure to implement carbon neutrality in industrial sectors relatively rapidly through detailed and thorough strategies. So going forward, continuous development of effective policies uh, that can support such directions is the important task of policy researchers such as myself, all of whom must generate um, greater wisdom together in the future. And finally, I would like to finish my presentation by highlighting the importance of international cooperation regarding carbon neutrality neutrality. As I conduct my research on carbon neutrality of Korea's industrial sectors, I have realized even more that implementing carbon neutrality in Korea is not an easy path, which goes to show that in policy area as well, diverse countries must cooperate and share each other's know-how. And to do this, I think more efforts must be um, desperately made. To give you a more concrete example, recently I began to insist is that uh, to realize carbon neutrality in industrial sectors in Korea, a policy um, such as a carbon contract for difference or CCFD is necessary. I said that this is necessary. And as I studied CCFD policy, I could gain a lot of quality information from the case of Germany, especially from various re reports um, published by the Agora Energy Vende. So just like today's webinar, I sincerely hope that we'll have more opportunities where we can discuss various policies on carbon neutrality for industrial sectors together and cooperate together. As carbon neutrality has become the goal of the entire humanity, I sincerely wish that the human cooperation for carbon neutrality will be further consolidated. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for your great presentation. Let me summarize this presentation briefly. Um, Korea is still seeing the coupling effect between economic growth and emission growth. But after the 2050 carbon neutral declaration, the industrial sector is making a lot of efforts to achieve this. And fossil fuels are being replaced with electricity. And we are in the process of doing it, but there was one question. And where can we get the electricity? Can we get that from nuclear power? So that was the one question asking, where are you gonna get the electric electricity to power all the plants? So please answer that later on. And if you have any other comments, please share them with us. And as I believe that the industrial sector in Korea, the cement and aluminum, these sectors have a lot of direct emissions and the four major um, industries will play a very pivotal role in achieving our 2030 NDC, not just for the 2050 carbon neutrality. So these four industries are very important because 2030 NDC to achieve this, the industrial sector must cut down and they must contribute. Without their contribution, we cannot achieve 2030 NDC. So in that aspect, I believe that we can discuss it further during our q &A session. So next, let's hear from German speakers. We will hear from Dr. Oliver Sartor in terms of how the transition is happening in Germany. And the first presentation will be delivered by Dr. Oliver Sartor, Senior Advisor of Agora Industry. So let me hand it over to him. Oliver, please go ahead and do it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you very much to uh, Her Excellency um, uh, Ambassador Cho uh, for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, we really appreciate the chance to, to present our work to you. Um, my presentation is, is on uh, accelerating the transition to climate neutrality. Uh, and actually, I'm going to focus on a, on a, on a European perspective uh, in my talk because many of the policies affecting Germany are coming from uh, European policy. And this also means that the scale of change is not just limited to Germany in Europe, but is also a, a European wide uh, phenomenon now. Uh, and I think this will impact uh, global markets, therefore, for uh, uh, low carbon uh, industrial products. So um, one, uh, uh, so actually some of the, the logic in, in Europe and in Germany is very similar to what uh, Sung Jun Lee described for Korea. Um, this graphic shows you uh, uh, industrial CO2 emissions in, in Europe uh, from 1990 up until 2018. Um, and what you can see is that while there was some decline in the late 90s and, and early 2000s uh, due to, to uh, structural economic effects, 
uh, uh, since then emissions basically stopped declining uh, in the 2010s. And now uh, as we aim for climate neutrality, uh, we have to rapidly accelerate industrial emissions reductions by 2030 to meet the EU's uh, higher climate ambition of minus 55% emissions reductions by 2030. Uh, and then we need to get to, to somewhere between 100 to 93% reductions in industry to achieve our climate neutrality goal by 2050. So this means that like in Korea, Europe also has to massively scale up uh, its policy packages to decarbonize industry. Um, <coughs> excuse me. One of the uh, challenges also in Europe that we face is that um, we have a, a, a lot of old, relatively old industrial sites it's in the steel sector, in the chemical sector, in the cement sector, for example. Uh, as you can see on this graph here, between 30 to 53% of the installed capacity uh, will need to reinvest, we think by 2030 uh, in the EU to maintain its, its production. Uh, and what this means is that we actually have a narrow window in the next eight years to um, make the shift from a gray or CO2 intensive production technologies to green production technologies. Uh, the good news is that, that as, uh, as Sung Jun Lee pointed out, um, there are a number of, of uh, um, uh, low carbon or climate neutral uh, uh, technologies that can be deployed uh, to make this shift in these sectors. Um, and I would very much agree with uh, Sung Jun Lee's comment also that simply uh, uh, being more energy efficient with existing processes will not be enough to achieve the goals now. We have to really change the technologies and the energy inputs completely in these processes, which makes it more challenging, but it also means that's what policy needs to focus on. The other part of, of the EU strategy that is really important to make the transition to climate neutral industry more manageable is to also focus on the demand for uh, virgin materials, uh, especially energy intensive materials like steel, aluminium, uh, cement and concrete, and plastics. Um, what, what this uh, slide shows is that uh, we have estimated potentials for Europe by 2030, which is the dark blue uh, waterfall graph, and by 2050, which is the, the dark blue and light blue uh, together. And these are the total emissions reductions that we think could be achieved by being much more efficient in the way we recycle uh, 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 these materials, we can often we have uh, low quality recycling or incineration of waste or landfilling uh, in Europe. And if we recycle many of these materials better, we can actually reduce the amount of primary materials we need, which makes the transition to energy intensive, uh, low carbon uh, production technologies more uh, simple to achieve. Uh, the good news is that there are um, a number of companies now in, in Europe uh, have understood that they have to transition and they have to transition relatively quickly uh, in, during this next uh, sort of eight to 10 year investment cycle um, that I was describing. Uh, so what this um, uh, uh, table shows you is just for the steel sector, um, there are, this is now an old table, there are now more companies than this, but this shows you uh, from basically a, a, a number of really large companies in Europe that are some of the main steel producers who are all committing now to develop uh, commercial scale uh, 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 projects to switch to clean hydrogen based steel making or first to natural gas and then clean hydrogen steel making in Europe uh, in the next 10 years. <clears throat> Um, however, the, the challenge for these companies uh, is that it's one thing to announce the, the, the will to change to low carbon technologies, but to actually get there, uh, they need a business case. Um, and that business case uh, requires some conditions to be in place uh, along the value chain uh, for their industry. Uh, and those conditions are often um, not in place completely today. Uh, so at Agora, we think about this in terms of the upstream part of the value chain, uh, the midstream part of the value chain, and the downstream part of the value chain. So let me explain. 
so upstream, what industrial uh, companies need, these energy intensive companies, is they need um, access to clean and affordable uh, low carbon energy. So that means uh, uh, low carbon power, uh, uh, low carbon hydrogen, uh, and also to biomass in some cases. Uh, they also need a CO2 infrastructure to do carbon capture and storage in some specific sectors like, like the cement sector. Um, so we have to provide this infrastructure and, and de-risk some of this, this capital investment in this infrastructure. Uh, then in the middle part of the value chain, what we call the midstream, uh, we have to make sure that investments in these new climate neutral processes and technologies uh, are uh, economically competitive. And so this has uh, two components. Firstly, we need to, um, uh, uh, we, well, we need higher carbon prices in the European uh, carbon market. Uh, up until now, the prices have been too low to justify uh, investments into climate neutral uh, technologies. Um, with the reforms that the European uh, Union is undertaking to achieve its higher climate targets, climate, uh, carbon prices have risen. However, as, climate, as carbon prices rise in the EU, we need to be careful to um, not create a competitiveness distortion with importers to the EU. And so this is why we're now discussing uh, um, uh, border adjustments to avoid having uh, a leakage of emissions from the EU to uh, 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 other countries uh, as we raise our carbon prices for our industrial sector. The other part of the competitiveness story uh, is that even with higher carbon prices, some technologies are so expensive that they will still need some support over and above the carbon price. Uh, and so for this, uh, we will need to think about uh, instruments, uh, as Sung Jun Lee mentioned, such as carbon contracts for difference, to uh, top up the carbon price, uh, to make the first generation of investments competitive. And then finally, we focus on the, on the downstream part of the value chain, where what's really important is to create markets and demand for these climate neutral uh, and circular uh, uh, materials. Um, so we have to create tools um, that can, like such as public procurement uh, or, or labeling or embedded carbon uh, uh, limits uh, for final products that can create the demand uh, and the willingness to pay this green premium for these green products. And then obviously a key condition for all of this to work is we need to uh, have better recycling and reuse of materials uh, uh, as well. So what the European uh, Union is doing is under a, uh, its initiative called the European Green Deal, uh, launched in 2020. Uh, it is starting to put in place a package of policies to address these different parts of the problem. So in the upstream uh, part of the value chain, the, the European Commission has proposed to create uh, hydrogen quotas for industry to prioritize hydrogen to industry. Um, it proposes to massively expand renewable energy deployment through a new renewable energy directive. Um, in the midstream part of the value chain, uh, there is going to be a European level carbon contracts for difference fund, uh, which could be quite a large fund. It, it will likely be um, tens of billions of euros at the European level. Many national governments such as France, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, um, are also looking at developing carbon contracts for difference at the national level as well for their industrials. The European Union is also in the process of um, uh, raising its carbon price via reform to the European carbon market. The, the overall cap on emissions will be lowered and that will increase the price of carbon for industrials. But as a, as a, as a companion policy to that, as I said, they are putting in place the, the so-called CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, um, to avoid any risk of, of carbon leakage and loss of, of uh, competitiveness because of this higher carbon price. And then in the downstream part of the value chain, uh, the commission is expected to propose uh, in, in March this, or later in, uh, in, in March this year, um, uh, public procurement requirements and, post, and also reporting of embedded carbon uh, in, in uh, buildings. Um, uh, to, to start to create these markets. Uh, and of course, there is also a circular economy package, a second circular economy package, 
which is expected to expand recycled content quotas for plastics uh, and propose some other measures to, to incentivize uh, uh, more and better uh, recycling uh, and less incineration of, of waste. Uh, so um, one of the, the key policies that, that I mentioned just before was this idea of carbon contracts for difference. Um, this uh, graphic shows you the basic idea very simply. Uh, the idea here, if you look on the left-hand side, is you have costs of producing, say, a ton of steel, which are not related to CO2. Uh, currently, under the European uh, uh, carbon market, you have some additional cost in principle, uh, which is the CO2 cost from the emissions which depends on the carbon price. At the, at the moment, however, one of the problems is we give free allocation to a free allocation of allowances to uh, reduce this cost because of carbon leakage concerns. So actually the, the, at the moment, the true cost is, is, does not include much CO2 cost. Um, the problem is the incremental cost uh, for uh, the, um, the new technologies, the low carbon ones is much higher than the carbon price in some cases. Um, what this means is that investors into low carbon technology, they can sell their free allocation to make up some of this incremental cost, but they still have this additional cost gap that they need to cover. And so the idea is that the carbon contract for difference would be an annual payment that depending on how high the carbon price is each year, it would cover this difference between the true technological cost and the carbon price cost. Um, the other thing that the, the EU is doing is, as I said, is thinking about moving to a border carbon adjustment. So under a border carbon adjustment scenario, <coughs> excuse me, there would be no more free allocation. So free allocation would go and the, co the costs of the European products would rise as well as for the importers by the same amount. Um, and, and then the contract for difference would pay the difference between the new product price uh, and the low carbon product price. Um, however, carbon contracts for difference are only one policy instrument. Um, we will also need to create demand, as we said before, for these markets. One, there are several tools that we need to create this demand and to scale it up. One tool that needs to be developed, however, is labeling of climate friendly uh, basic materials like steel, for example. Uh, so uh, as I imagine you have in Korea, in the EU, we already have labeling like this for energy performance, for example, for appliances. Um, the idea is that in, in the EU, we will create um, a similar system, but for basic materials, whether it's steel or, or, or cement or, uh, or other products. And this is important because it can help, for example, public uh, uh, procurement to choose only to buy the lowest carbon steel or the lowest carbon cement. Uh, and the same is also true for, for companies as well. Uh, such transparency can help the companies in the private sector to also create these lead markets for low carbon materials. Uh, another important policy uh, that, that is also being developed, as I mentioned, is to focus on um, uh, reducing um, um, the embedded carbon uh, in the final product. So, so far we've talked about policies that focus on the basic material like the steel or cement, but actually, in the end, what we want is not to decarbonize the steel or cement, but to decarbonize the car or the building uh, or the plastic packaging, which is the final product that the consumer actually wants. Uh, and so there are many ways to decarbonize that final product, uh, including by more recycling uh, of, of materials, using materials more efficient, efficiently, substituting to uh, lower carbon uh, uh, materials or materials that store carbon like wood, for example. Um, uh, and, and so one of the policies that are, is important is to focus on reporting, having companies report on the, the true embedded carbon uh, uh, in their final products coming from their value chains. Because if we can do this, this will incentivize and help them to choose lower carbon suppliers for all of their inputs into their goods and to design their goods in ways that have less materials and less carbon. Uh, and so this is a really important policy instrument for the medium and longer term to actually get to climate neutrality. Um, now you might wonder well, what, what is going to be the cost of, of doing all of this transition? Well, actually what's interesting is that at Agora, we did some analysis of how much low carbon technologies might cost uh, for different value chains. And what's interesting is 
the, um, the, the carbon cost is higher at the beginning of the value chain when you have the very uh, energy intensive CO2 intensive process. So the cement making or the steel making, you can have an increase in cost of say 20% to 75% of the value of the material, which is very high, right? Um, but once that good gets worked uh, on by, by the value chain and value is added by labor, um, by the time you get to the final product, such as the house or the car, it's actually closer to one to 2% uh, of the, the total cost of the good. So, so actually, this is one of the reasons why we think these uh, embedded carbon policies can work because um, the final cost for the actual uh, final good is actually very low uh, compared to the, 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 the carbon saved. Okay, so I will stop my presentation there and, and hand over to my colleague Eileen to uh, explain uh, the international perspective. Well, thank you very much. As I listened to your presentation, I had a few questions. And I believe those questions can be asked during the Q&A session. But thank you very much for your presentation. And I can see a lot of steelmakers in Europe are going for green hydrogen and uh, now, I guess uh, it's 2025 and onwards that uh, the hydrogen will finally be commercialized. That's my understanding. Now, in Korea, uh, 2030, even when we reach 2030, green hydrogen um, uh, steel making is going to be still very challenging. That's what we are expecting. So uh, European cases, the green hydrogen and how that can be made into steel making, um, we want to find out when that can be commercialized and what in that regard, also where this green hydrogen can be supplied and sourced. And that price, uh, whether that's going to be reasonable, those are some of the questions that we'll be asking during the Q&A session. And also, also uh, you know about the RE100, the R Renewable Energy 100 policy. And we would also like to learn about the system in Europe. Uh, in Korea, also, we are worried of and concerned about how that can impact the exporters and importers. So we're going to get to that later during the Q&A session. Now, from now on, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Eileen, uh, Dr. Eileen Shakola, also from Akora Industry. Are you ready? Yes, thank you. Um, not a doctor, unfortunately, but uh, my name is Eileen Shaukas. Um, I'm a project manager at Agora's industry team. Oliver, could you still share your slides? Thank you. Um, yes, and I will talk about the international perspective on uh, industrial decarbonization. Uh, next slide, please. So over the last year, we've basically seen a number of initiatives being launched at the international level, um, and they all aim at enabling the global industrial decarbonization. Um, so I've picked out a few just to illustrate um, that 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 we basically that we basically have in place a lot of initiatives um, at every step of the industrial decarbonization. So starting with R and D, um, Mission Innovation has been launched in Paris alongside the Paris Agreement in 2015, and members of the Mission Innovation intend to collaborate on innovation in key sectors to really drive investments in practical action, in research, development, and demonstration. And I know that uh, both Korea and Germany are part of Mission Innovation, and Mission Innovation actually launched a um, net zero industry um, mission at the COP26, which is intended to really accelerate global collaboration in um, basic innovation R&D in uh, energy intensive industries. So another important initiative that we have, basically the next layer um, in terms of building an enabling framework internationally for the decarbonization of industry, is the Clean Energy Ministerial's Industrial De Decarbonization Initiative. Um, the IDDI is uh, it's coordinated by UNIDO actually, so by uh, UN Agency for Industrial Development. And they work on um, greenhouse gas data standards and green public procurement policies. So really getting countries together to collaborate on what kind of standards do we have in greenhouse gas accounting. Um, 
collaborate on aligning green public procurement policies with the aim of creating lead markets for these for these um, decarbonization efforts to, to plug into. And then of course, talking about the enabling framework, um, what kind of data structures do we need to have this greenhouse gas reporting in place? A similar initiative is Responsible Steel, which is very steel focused. They basically, as, as, as Oliver has um, presented in his presentation, they're working on the issue of um, that we need labeling for green products and for low carbon products. So Responsible Steel has A, worked on standard setting. We have a lot of different, the landscape of standards out there is, is vast. There's um, the greenhouse gas protocol, there's the ISOs, um, and there's no harmonization of who uses what. So Responsible Steel is one global initiative that basically brings together steel producers um, and corporates to, to agree on a standard for um, decarbonized steel plus some ESG criteria um, to create these lead markets and create this momentum. The first Movers Coalition does that from a private sector perspective. It was launched by the US at the COP26 and um, it's basically a bias club of um, 25 major global companies who make uh, pledges to ba basically saying, if you produce it, we will buy it. Um, and sending that strong demand signal to the industry that once they decarbonize, their decarbonized products will actually face demand in the market. Similarly, you have Steel Zero, which is kind of a smaller version of that where companies um, make procurement pledges for net zero emission steel um, by 2050, so 100% net zero steel by 2050, but with interim targets for 2030. Um, again, sending a strong demand signal for the industry that once you have a decarbonized product, there will be an international market to, to pay the green premium. And then finally, um, a, a very important um, in, uh, initiative that came out of COP26 is the Breakthrough Agenda, which is very like a concerted effort of very different sectors including steel. Um, it, um, it's, as I know, Korea and Germany are both part of the breakthrough agenda or have signed onto it at least, um, as are the US, India, EU and China. Um, so it represents 70% of the world's economy. And under the breakthrough agenda, there's sub, sub initiatives who really push to make low carbon technologies um, be market ready by 2030. Next slide, please. What I just presented, I mean, it's, it's not a it's not a comprehensive list of all the of all the initiatives out there. Um, there's very many different small initiatives um, for global industrial decarbonization, um, and important ones also that I didn't mention here. We we've also seen appetite at a at an institutional level, at more of an, a, an official level, um, to accelerate um, industrial decarbonization globally. Um, basically. Um, starting from the acknowledgement that there's, you know, broad consensus that the UNFCCC process is not is insufficient to really kickstart the global industrial decarbonization. So, with that in mind, um, the International Monetary Fund um, announced or uh, proposed in in June 2021 um, that there could be something like a carbon pricing club, an international carbon price flow through which countries would come together. Um, initially, a group of key trading partners. Um, would come together and agree amongst themselves on a, on a carbon price floor um, to address um, the risk of carbon leakage. Another idea was that this carbon price floor could then be open or this, this carbon club could, could be open um, to the inclusion of other countries and also adjust the level of price floor um, according to the country's um, development. The OECD then, um, coming from the angle that not all countries in the world would want to um, really have carbon pricing, um, they, they proposed a global plan for a platform um, on, or framework through which you could translate um, non-pricing non policies such as environmental regulation into a carbon price equivalent. Basically the idea is if you have policies that uh, th that focus on the carbon price and it's unfair to those countries who don't have carbon pricing in place, but have other ways of address addressing climate change. The WTO then um, said in October that it's, it's, kind of, it's detrimental to, um, to global trade um, to have all these fragmented versions of, of carbon pricing, that there should really be a uniform carbon price. Um, 
Germany now um, in, in, in the fall picked up the idea of a climate club, we want to call it a climate alliance, and made it really a very broad proposal of how such international collaboration could look like. And in its proposal, it, it, it proposed an alliance for climate competitiveness and industry, and basically picked up the idea of members of the carbon club could, or the, of the climate alliance could agree on a carbon price floor, but also to have more collaborative formats on standards, on green public procurement, um, on other types of policy, on carbon leakage policy, um, and on including uh, developing countries and work with tech transfers, for example, to really make this a global effort. A final proposal that, that was put forward in, uh, in November that could be seen as, as a form of, of small bilateral cl climate club is the EU-US agreement on steel and aluminum trade. Um, basically, it committed both part participants to negotiate by 2024 an agreement to jointly restrict access to their markets by non-participants with high uh, greenhouse gas intensity or overcapacity, basically initially put in place to, um, to get rid of, of the tariffs that were imposed under the Trump presidency, um, but then adding that layer of collaboration on, on this climate dimension um, for aluminum and steel. Next slide, please. Well, given this um, broad range of proposals that we have out there of initiatives and sort of more climate club, climate alliance type of ideas, um, we've been working at Agora on, on thinking about what are the areas where we really need international collaboration to really advance the global industrial transition. Um, a couple of areas for us stand out that are really important. Um, you'll see that none of this includes carbon pricing for now. Um, one very important area for global collaboration would be to create scalable markets for low carbon and circular materials. So that means on the one hand, creating the enabling framework for these markets, um, meaning collaborating on standards for accounting. Um, and then secondly, um, growing these markets through aligning uh, green public procurement policies or even aligning um, regulation in markets, um, similar to what, what Oliver described, where you basically through regulating and products, you could create a lot of demand for low carbon materials. Secondly, countries could get together and set sectoral milestones for industrial decarbonization. So coordinate target setting by when you want to decarbonize, say your steel sector or want to reach a certain degree of decarbonization in the cement sector, for example, um, to really initiate that momentum and on a country level, then have a target kind of like a lighthouse that other policies can then sort of lead, lead up to. Thirdly, and importantly, is capacity building for industrial decarbonization in developing countries. This effort, or this global effort for industrial decarbonization cannot leave developing countries behind. These countries still have a lot of growth in front of them and um, having the, allowing them to leapfrog sort of the dirty path of development um, is key in, in fighting climate change and also, of course, has a clear, clear angle of justice. Fourth, um, we need to agree on principles for green subsidies, as, um, as was presented be before. Um, this global transition of industrial decarbonization will involve hundreds of billions of dollars of R&D support and support for pilot projects, um, protection from loss of competitiveness, such as free allowances, and carbon price guarantees and CCFDs. Um, so finding an agreement on which, um, which measures are actually acceptable, what kind of framework do we have for green subsidies, um, so that we don't end up in, in trade frictions and disputes over trade law is really important at this stage. And then finally, and relatedly, um, we need to agree on principles and best practices for carbon leakage prevention. We have we are sort of pioneering new types of policies now um, with the with the CBAM um, at the European level, and this this is only something that will accelerate in the in the months and years to come as differences in global um, climate ambition will prevail in the near term. So finding agreement on um, principles and best practice for carbon leakage prevention is actually something that is really key um, in the near future. Next slide, please. Oliver has already um, talked a little bit about uh, the European Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Um, and basically in the EU, and we've been told that this is also the case in Korea, free allocation has been to date the main uh, 
main tool through which carbon leakage has been addressed. Um, but under increased climate action, um, it's simply not a sustainable solution anymore. So you see the EU must begin to move to an alternative system before 2030 that follows then the dual goal of not just avoiding carbon leakage, but also incentivizing the industrial transition. As you can see, um, the light blue bars basically um, are the, the amount of ETS allowances that are um, in circulation. And, and you, you can see that they, under the new, um, on, under the re revised ETS cap, they are decreasing um, over the coming years significantly. If we now continue this practice of free allocation at the full, 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 be full benchmark, this will mean that um, by 2030, um, free allocation will account for 65% of the total ETS cap. And then in, in 2036, it would be 91%. So that is simply not sustainable um, if 91% um, of, of the total cap goes to free allocation. Um, hence the need to, to really move to a different system, um, which is the CBAM. Next slide, please. Oliver has already um, uh, explained uh, the, the functioning of this, um, but just kind of to, to, to go into, logic, into the logic once again, you under the CBAM, the left-hand side of the picture, you basically, you basically get rid of free allocation um, and everything that's freely allocated will be phased out and auctioned instead. Um, at the same time, foreign producers also face a carbon charge at the border um, meaning that the domestic level uh, playing field will be leveled. Um, this then raises both of these mechanisms, raise funds to address, to reduce the cost uh, of, of green breakthrough technologies through subsidies um, and makes, allows for carbon, carbon cost pass through, which then is a really important investment signal um, to really get these final investments in climate neutral technologies going. Final slide. Yeah, to, to kind of draw these two pictures together, um, basically a lot of the climate alliance or climate club proposals have kind of, um, have flirted with the idea, if you will, that this could be a, um, a substitute to a CBAM. So basically saying, well, if we all agree on a global carbon price, then you know, there no, no carbon leakage can happen and then we don't need a CBAM. This is theoretically would be true, um, but it's not it's it's not realistic in the near to, near to midterm. So to think about how these two ideas of of a CBAM and a climate alliance interact with each other, they, we actually find that they augment each other in really important ways. So climate alliances, um, with their way of scaling up international demand for low carbon products and harmonizing international standards and trade, they can actually play an important role in reducing the trade tensions. Um, that may be caused by a CBAM. They can also play an important role to mitigate the pressure on exports by, by creating these lead markets um, that, that uh, decarbonized but higher cost um, companies can then export to. At the same time, the EU CBAM can raise funds for the industrial transition, as we said, which then again goes into the international collaboration on, on innovation, um, and can be can be can be dispersed internationally, um, but at the same time and importantly, it raises the stakes of the negotiations. Because in the absence of of collaborative of collaborative solutions, we will end up in a picture where we have lots of different carbon border adjustments. Um, so this is really sort of some, something that we don't want. It's basically the carrot and the stick, and and the climate alliances are thus a really powerful way to really um, collaborate and and. Um, create global, um, global incentives for, for lead markets. To end on a positive note, I mean, carbon border adjustment, they, they will remain necessary, as I said, in the short term, but significant uh, potential lies in the global industrial decarbonization, as was said by Her Excellency initially, um, this also holds enormous uh, growth and employment potential for economies, um, as well as positive contributions, of course, to the fight against climate change. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Suket. That was a very interesting presentation. And we have a lot of questions that we have received. So I'm going to answer some of the questions maybe later on during our Q&A session later on. I personally believe that Korea's ETS is being implemented as well. 
and the ETS, Korean ETS, the allowances. We have some free allowances or we have some auctioned allowances. So these differences are very important. So going forward in Korea as well, I hope that the ETS will be able to incentivize, incentivize the industries to decarbonize and transition to low carbon industries. So I hope that the ETS will work as an incentive for decarbonization. But to do that, I would love to discuss more with other uh, stakeholders in terms of how to do that. Thank you so much for your great presentation. And next, we're going to hear from uh, two Korean experts who will um, do the discussion. So first, Dr. Lee from Kiet, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for that introduction. My name is Yi Jae-yoon. I am the Director for Materials and Sustainability Division of Korea Institute for Industrial Economics and Trade, or KIET. Great to meet you all, and thank you very much to the three presenters. And um, I've learned so much from you, so I want to thank you for this great opportunity. So today, I would like to talk about the situations in Korea. And Dr. Lee, the first presenter, had already mentioned a lot. So I'm just going to add on what was already mentioned and would like to share with you uh, what we can do in Korea to achieve the carbon neutrality. So that's what I'm going to do. So first, uh, let's see what's happening in Korea. Manufacturing, which is Korea's flagship industry, faces a number of significant challenges. The Korean economy is now entering into a low growth phase as a long-term growth rate declines by 1% every five years, and the productivity remains stagnant. And also, because Korean industries is already deeply intertwined in the global value chain, technology wars and power struggle amongst major countries can be a huge burden to our economy. So that's the situation right now in Korea. Also, in addition to this, polarization within industries, low birth rate, and aging population pose a serious manpower shortage problem, aggravating the already difficult situation. And also because we are very expert driven, a lot of these difficulties can add to it. So this like going green and going low carbon is one big problem, but not only that, I'm, I, my point is there's a lot of other problems that are aggravating the situation. And this is a huge burden, making this carbon neutrality goal in the next 30 years can be a very daunting goal. And as Dr. Lee mentioned, uh, we, are, we have a very ambitious goal. So again, this is going to be a rather a big challenge for Korea. And I think that's the gist of what's, what's we're, what we're facing right now. Uh, the major six greenhouse gas emitting industries, namely steel, petrochemical, cement, oil refining, semiconductor, and display, account for 80% of the total industry's emission, basically takes up the largest portion. Now, the problem is that uh, Korea is, for example, in the crude steel production, we're number six in the world, fourth in petrochemical production, fifth in refining capacity, second in global semiconductor market share, and the first in global display market share. So uh, major Korean industries, uh, we, we are very competitive globally now, but they are very much strong and heavy in emitting greenhouse gases. As such, our globally competitive industries are heavy emitters, so we have to find a way to maintain this competitive edge while transforming these industries to become more green and equal, friendly and low carbon. So that's going to be some of the uncertainties and concerns that a lot of these industries will have to address and how the policies can also play a role to address those uncertainties and many of the concerns. And as mentioned, right now, it's important that we focus really on these major issues. And the first thing I think we can do is uh, exactly what Dr. Lee has already mentioned. Now in the energy sector, more than anything else, I think is the, um, the most critical sector to achieve carbon neutrality in the industrial sector. I know a lot of progresses have been made, but more direct 
linkage between energy and the industries will have to be made. For example, a detailed roadmap for supply of green energy, such as hydrogen and clean electricity, and the long-term energy price outlook. And for example, for the supply, how it's going to be sourced locally or from abroad. And in that case, whether there's going to be any government support and more detailed and specific information from the government to the private sectors will have to be provided to address the concerns. Another big problem or the uncertainty is, of course, the price. Nobody has a clear idea or clue about the long-term energy price outlook. Now, the uncertainties are rampant, and the government can play a role by providing information from all the analysis. Only then, companies will set their mid to long term carbon neutral strategies without much of the uncertainties that linger around until now. One more thing I'd like to mention is that in Korea, uh, the Korean government is focusing mostly on the R&D and basically only on R&D. But the carbon neutral technology in comparison to the European countries, it's only about 80% of the capacity. So our technology still uh, lag behind when it comes to carbon neutrality. And uh, R&D is not speeding up as much as we would like. So we need a new system. Uh, entirely relying on the old system isn't going to be sufficient. So uh, summing up, we need to expand the R&D and also we need to incorporate the conglomerates who are the greenhouse emitters. And we also need to have a new system for all of that. That only then we can scale up the R&D and incentivize conglomerates and enhance international exchanges as well. One thing I would like to add to it is that um, creating an ecosystem is of urgent matter. For the top three greenhouse gas emitting industries, such as steel, petrochemical, cement, no short term reduction measures are in place at this point, as you all know. Now, steel scrap and plastic waste are important carbon reduction tools that we can leverage. However, right now we're still skeptical as to whether we can procure enough domestically or from abroad. And in the case of the iron and scrap, it's recognized as an important resource and exports are restricted in Europe and some other countries. Now, considering all of that, we need to have more clear picture of what's going to happen, how we're going to source the steel scrap and plastic waste locally or how we're going to source them from abroad, so more specific details will need to be in place. Meanwhile, the demand for eco-friendly cars and secondary batteries is expected to increase for sure. Now, the problem is that going a higher demand is one thing, but we need to make sure that we have the raw materials to back this up without going through any major shortage problems. Uh, now, looking at the car, the eco-friendly car production or manufacturing plan, it's likely that the materials and parts supply will not catch up with this green car manufacturing. And it therefore calls for a stronger ecosystem for green transportation. And uh, as you know, a lot of materials and parts come from China. So we'll have to also work on that. And also uh, ways to have more secure supply of the minerals or battery waste is of high importance. As for the eco friend, eco neutrality, or sorry, carbon neutrality, a lot of people are talking about the new industries. But I think what we need to prioritize is how to make the existing flagship industries become more low carbon rather than creating an entirely new industry there. For that, a lot of measures are in place in other countries, and we can also benchmark them. And for example, how we can incentivize the green fuels and green materials and also financial and financial arrangement and support. So both uh, direct and indirect support from the government can be of 
uh, high importance. But at the same time, not only just the government, but also the private sector can play a big role. During the COVID-19, they saw an oil price hike, which helped the bottom line for some of the industries such as steel making, refineries, and petrochemical. Now this uh, better bottom line can be utilized for uh, better purposes, such as more investment in the low carbon technologies. Also, there are some promising aspects for example, the lightweight steel sheet and high functional steel for energy, and also more high value added steel, mixed cement, high strength fiber. These are some of the promising aspects. And now that portion can be expanded going forward. And this will help the already strong industries in Korea become more competitive and have a better structures to compete in the, the sector. And also, this can be an important structuring for the Korean industries to stay afloat during the transition phase. Now, in many other countries, there are support systems and schemes ready for the hard to abate sectors and more are being in place. And I know in German, Germany, there are a lot of systems for that as well. So the Korean government is looking towards uh, these great examples to learn from. And we're very much focused on the, what we can do. For example, the CCFD and more information could be shared to help us understand and benchmark. And also ETS or carbon tax uh, can also be incorporated to tailor to the situations in Korea. Not only that, many of the international organizations are also uh, working towards uh, to increase the efficiency or study the efficiency of the emitting greenhouse emitting materials and the industries. So that's one uh, a lot of international organizations, which as already mentioned, are focusing on the efficiency factor. So we understand that as well. We echo what they're saying and uh, policies will have to come together with it. And now Agora uh, made a great presentation and I'm sure that can be a great insight to us. And there are five also um, measures that you mentioned for the international cooperation and we completely agree with that and uh, the WTO factor and how that can be uh, it can lead to global consensus. I believe this is very important for, uh, elements that we need to look into. And also the imbalance. If imbalance in the carbon uh, policies is going to be a problem globally. So that's why and uh, we need to make sure that uh, CBAM and similar global uh, coordination is going to be extremely important. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Dr. Lee, we are slightly short um, behind the schedule, actually. So moving right into our next uh, panelist, Ms. Kim ji Sun from POSCO Research Institute, please. Good morning. I'm Kim ji Sun from POSCO Research Institute. It's my great honor and pleasure to be part of such a meaningful forum. Thank you so much for the invitation. We have um, we had presentations from the KEEI and Agora. In case of me, I am doing the research on trade and climate related um, projects and the CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. I will talk about that. And I will also talk about how the steel industry in Korea is making the decarbonization efforts. So first of all, regarding the CBAM, I would like to make a brief comment about CBAM. As was mentioned earlier, often as major economies strengthened their carbon regulation and related policies, uh, concerns about carbon leakage are growing and they are growing concerns. And at this juncture to solve the problem of carbon leakage, EU Commission um, announced the CBAM and is targeting five items, including steel, cement, aluminum, and legislative processes are taking place at the moment to adopt it. And based on CBAM laws, we published a policy brief in collaboration with my other colleagues that I worked with 
together in Washington, D.C. at the Peterson Institute of International Economics. And according to the analysis of the items subject to the CU EBAM, the I in terms of exports to EU, based on the export amount, Korea is um, the largest exporting country in the EU regarding CBAM items after Russia, China, Turkey, UK, and Ukraine. In addition, among Korea's entire CBAM exports to the EU, more than 90% are steel products. So when CBAM is implemented, we believe that steel will be hit the hardest um, among other exporting items. And the impact of CBAM implantation will vary depending on countries and industries. But in the short term, um, free allocations provided under the EU ETS will be reflected on CBAM, uh, which could limit its impact in the short term. However, in the mid to long term, CBAM will increase the burden on the part of exporting partners, which will increase um, the economic and technological and administrative burdens. So the exporting partners will have direct and indirect burden, and it's expected to go up. Of course, the embeddedness is the main standard of the CBAM. So we have some technological issues. And when border is crossed, um, it will increase the administrative cost of crossing the borders. And Korean steel industry is well aware of the fact that to address the issue of climate change, it's really important for the steel industry to make proactive carbon reduction efforts. In addition, on top of the corporate level efforts, um, Carbon pricing schemes such as ETS conducted in Korea are just as important. And to make the transition towards decarbonized society, they agree that innovation and investment must be promoted and diverse carbon reduction policies and regulations are required in those areas. And one thing to note is that carbon pricing or calculating carbon emissions on certain products, for instance, does not have internationally agreed upon methodology. And there's a lack of internationally adopted carbon pricing schemes. And under such circumstances, CBAM and measures targeting imported products uh, could work as new import restrictions, which will cause trade conflict among different countries. Uh, therefore, that also could undermine multilateral um, efforts to address the issue of climate change, which is facing concerns. And that's why for agenda items, the need internal um, consensus, multilateral negotiations must be expanded and adequate discussions must take place. And let me talk about Korea's decarbonization effort. And just like Germany, Korea has a manufacturing oriented economic structure and Korean economy is heavily reliant on exports as well. And in particular, based on crude steel, Korea is a major steel producing country in the world. And Korea is a steel exporting country, which has excellent product competitiveness. And decarbonization and carbon neutrality are the most important challenges faced by the Korean steel industry, just like Germany. But at the same time, uh, these challenges present opportunities to enhance a green competitiveness of these products uh, through product innovation. And major economies are declaring to become carbon neutral and they are seeking stringent carbon reduction policies. And investors are also demanding ESG requirements, including climate change response. And in addition, automakers and other players that are using steel as their raw materials are asking, are making declarations to become carbon neutral as well in their value chains. And these customers are asking steel makers to, to supply a low carbon and eco-friendly products. Therefore, Korean steel industry is taking preemptive measures because this is life or death matters to them. To And they are taking preemptive measures to invest in technologies to produce decarbonized and low carbon steel. And they are also upgrading their production processes and making various efforts. And in case of POSCO, uh, back in 2020, we declared um, its 2050 carbon neutrality goals and we announced three major low carbon strategies. So let me talk about these strategies in brief, uh, just briefly. First is green process. It's about reducing carbon emissions in the production process and energy efficiency must be enhanced and economic low carbon materials and fuels should become green replacements and scraps must be better utilized and CCUS technology must be applied and other measures have been put in place. And ultimately by developing and commercializing the hydrogen reduction steel making technology, POSCO is aiming to achieve its carbon neutrality goals in steel making processes. And the next is green product, that's the second one high tensile strength auto steel plates and high efficiency electric steel plates and other green products must be developed and sold so that we can increase our competitiveness and do better. 
and core business areas must be expanded to cover materials for secondary batteries, hydrogen, LNG, in order to make the transition towards eco-friendly professional material maker. And the final one is about green partnership and for decarbonization transition of the steel industry, POSCO is proactively participating in diverse initiatives and strengthening cooperation with government industries and clients investors. So we cannot do this alone. So we are um, cooperating more. In February 2021, along with five major Korean steel makers, POSCO launched Green Steel Commission and announced the 2050 Carbon Neutrality Joint Declaration. And in October 2021, POSC, in collaboration with the World Steel Association, hosted for the first time in the world um, Hydrogen Iron and Steel Making Forum 2021. And we shared development trends of hydrogen reduction steel making technology with major steel makers. And we also show, shared low carbon policy information and promised to cooperate better. And POSC is also pursuing cooperation with its raw material suppliers to pursue decarbonization. And we are expanding our cooperation with our clients to develop low carbon technology. And as was emphasized by other speakers, let me talk about international cooperation and public-private co partnership. Um, in case of steel industry, diverse efforts are being made to achieve decarbonization, but large-scale investment on low-carbon, eco-friendly technologies such as hydrogen reduction steel making is inevitable. And industry-wide cooperation as well as the role of government is very important. Um, to promote decarbonization technology development across the entire economy. So the government has to play a pivotal role. Well, national projects related to technology development as well as expansion of green fund and renewable energies are being carried out as part of Korean government's efforts to expand the use of eco-friendly energy sources. And various government level policies are being implemented to meet these goals. And we are expecting that those policies will get strengthened going forward. In case of German steel makers, decarbonization cooperation is being consolidated on supply chain levels, which includes its clients, such as car makers and power companies. And I'm also aware of the fact that German government is providing support to steel makers to develop innovative technologies in order to make gradual transition from from furnace-oriented production process to hydrogen-based production process. So I believe that the two countries should cooperate on corporate level to develop these technologies. And moreover, to encourage decarbonized steel across the entire country, to encourage decarbonization across the entire country, we have to um, promote low carbon innovation and information sharing channels between governments must be strengthened. And to achieve decarbonization goal, technology cooperation is very important. And on multilateral level, stakeholders must discuss proactively how to establish and develop methodologies and systems to measure, report, and verify carbon emissions so that substantial results can be generated as soon as possible. And the Agora research also talked about it, the climate cup pro proposed by Germany and the adoption of international carbon pricing scheme proposed by IMF and other international organizations and entities uh, will be a starting point to bring about change and the international community must participate in these efforts and we can cooperate better to create a better society thank you well thank you thank you so much for your great comments so we're going to have a q a session so we had three presenters dr lee dr sator and dr shoket so could you please turn on your camera if you are one of those presenters so three presenters, please take a look at the questions filed by our audience and give us short answers regarding these questions. Maybe you can make additional comments, but we are running out of time. So I will give you only about three minutes per each speaker. So please make it short. Give us the zest of your answers. So first, Dr. Lee, please go ahead. Regarding the electricity, where are you going to get it? So Korea's carbon neutral scenario, according to it, by 2050, the renewable energy will take up about 70% of the energy mix. Nuclear power will be less than 10%. It's pretty low. So in that case, according to the current scenario, the replaced electricity will be coming from renewable energies mostly. But after the presidential election last week, regarding the portion of 
nuclear power, our incoming conservative president elect will be increasing the portion of nuclear power a bit. And regarding steel, cement, and other industries, what is the most promising technology? So that was the question. As of now, we believe the steel industry is about the hydrogen reduction technology. That is the most promising technology for steel industry. For petrochemical, that's a CCUS technology and bio or the fuel replacing technologies are promising. And when it comes to cement, we don't have a lot of technological alternatives because the raw material itself has a lot of emissions from the industrial process emissions. So we have to replace the existing fossil fuel. And we, we need to reduce. So the fuel replacement, reducing the raw materials less or replacing the fossil fuels with renewables, that's basically the promising technology for cement. Thank you very much. Next, Dr. Sator. Yes, so I mean, on, on the question of electricity, I think the, um, um, the, the I think it needs to be borne in mind that there are um, lots of ways, first of all, to reduce the total energy demand you need to decarbonize, right? So the more efficient you are with materials, the more you, you have enhanced circularity. So basically closed loop recycling. So where you, you, you maintain the quality of the scrap flows or the waste uh, to be able to remake the same product with the same inputs. This limits how much renewables you need. And then for the, for the amount of energy, I think there increasingly in Europe, we find there are constraints in some land use or public acceptance, but there are increasingly clever ways to solve those problems. So for example, um, we're now talking about agri-solar agri uh, uh, solutions where you can actually enhance the yields of agricultural crops while also having solar panels on the same, on the same uh, territory. So we think there are, or we're doing a lot of offshore wind, et cetera. So there are a lot of ways to solve these problems we think in practice. Um, you also have to be efficient with the way you use energy. So the grid needs to be optimized to use energy very efficiently. Um, to balance the, the peaks and troughs in, 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 uh, in uh, renewable energy supply. And so uh, electricity market design is also really critical. So there are many ways to try and uh, resolve this problem. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sakit, please. Um, I, should, should I answer this? Sorry, I didn't quite understand. There's, there's questions in the chat and there's one I think that relates to my Presentation. Yes, shall I? Presentation. That's right. Should I take that? Um, yes. So there was a question asked: um, Without a global carbon price, wouldn't it be de detrimental for exporting EU sectors to abandon the free allocations? Um, I guess the way we think about it is that you sort of think about it more holistically in terms of global developments, other policy packages that are in place. Um, absolutely, it would be very desirable to just have a global carbon price. Um, is that something that's realistic? In the short term, no, um, especially given different levels of development, um, different preferences for policy mix. So in the short term, we won't see a global carbon price. There's still a need to get rid of the free allocations for the reasons that we presented earlier, um, given that um, the free allocations, they mute the, the price signal that you get um, from the carbon price. So it's um, they're actually destroying sort of the investment case that you need into clean technologies. So we can't we can't hold on to them. Um, to to kind of look at the opportunity here, or, say, or kind of hedge the risk, I guess, if you think about um, what that means for exports, um, we actually put up a proposal for the CBAM that kind of phases out allocation a bit slower than uh, the Commission proposed, um, with a sort of checkpoint process. In, in, in 2029, um, when you sort of uh, re reassess what um, the introduction of the CBAM has meant for um, exports and then reassess what, what, what that could mean. Um, the idea being that if you phase it out slower in the time, we, we actually see a lot of international appetite. We see a lot of pledges for climate neutrality by, by mid-century. And we actually, we are somewhat optimistic that um, the international community will actually move faster in the direction of decarbonization um, and also um, pass um, carbon pricing policies. Um, so that this risk to exporters will actually decrease over time. Um, and th this is basically, yeah, that's, that's my response to this answer. I'm not sure if, if anyone else wants to add. Thank you, Dr. Sack. Uh, actually, we have some extra five minutes. So I would like to uh, give you 
uh, last one minute for the last uh, remark. So from the Dr. Lee, Sangjun Lee, uh, would you give us some final remark during the uh, one minute? 네, 감사합니다. 어, 사실 저는 탄소 중립... Well, thank you very much. I think that the industrial sector carbon neutrality is important. I always say that we still have a lot of uncertainty when it comes to decarbonizing industrial sectors, which is why I believe that we can't simply put all the eggs in one basket. So we need to have a diversified portfolio strategy and options should remain open because we still have a lot of uncertainties. But using all the options, we should be open to all options so that we can make utmost effort to bring about decarbonization globally. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, so my, my, my feeling is that um, change is not linear. Change can often be um, a rupture. It can be, it can be a, a, an exponential process. So I, I think that you know, if I were advising Korean industry or even German industry, um, I would I would be saying these different changes, the CBAM, the climate uh, uh, clubs, the new initiatives to create markets for low carbon steel, uh, the risk of the United States putting in place trade measures to restrict uh, high carbon steel. All of these things, I think, risk at some point reaching a tipping point where there is a very high cost for industries that are not low carbon. And that could come much faster when it actually comes than people expect. And I think what European companies are doing and policymakers is they've recognized that risk. And so they're trying to put in place strong policies now so that in the next five, 10 years, we get to this much more uh, ambitious uh, point. Because otherwise we see that as being a bigger risk to our competitiveness than the cost of climate action itself. Dr. Shah. Yes, um, I think what, what I would want to, to finish with is that from, from our discussions that we have with stakeholders in the German environment, we see that a lot of downstream markets are actually really, really ready to buy. Um, and, and, and there's a strong signal from consumers. Um, we see a lot of, we, we speak to German OEMs and, and it's, it's, it's high on their list to get these decarbonized products. Um, and right now in that field, actually, it's like there's more, more demand than supply. So I do have hope that there's very strong signals coming from the private sector. Um, I think it'll be a very, very important lever to um, to look at. And um, yeah, so I'm 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 hopeful. Well, thank you so much. Well, it's a shame that we don't have enough time. Well, today we discussed how to achieve carbon neutrality between German and Korean cases and experts. And as a moderator, I felt that. The industrial sector inevitably has a lot of direct emissions from cement, um, steel, and the industrial processes like semiconductor and display, they have the um, industrial emissions. So each industry has different situation. So when it comes to steel or cement or petrochemical, which have a lot of direct emissions, we need to apply technological innovation to reduce emissions. Otherwise, without these technologies, we can never achieve carbon neutrality. But that applies not only to Korea, but to the world, to all countries and companies. So developing these clean technologies are the most important factors. And through this seminar, we could share more information. And I hope that this will serve as a platform we can, where we can make contributions to decarbonization of the industrial sector. So with that, let me conclude today's seminar and presentations and debates. And I'd like to pass it over to Nicola. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much everyone on the podium for contributing to this webinar. You can still keep your cameras on. You don't no need to switch it off already because <laughs> um, this is the big farewell round. So maybe also um, not just the presenters, but also the two discussants that were commenting um, after the presentations. Um, we have all the presentations shown already uploaded on our website, and we will also make sure that you can also find it on the website of the Embassy of the Republic of Korea. So you can, um, if it was maybe a little bit too much of information in such short time, you can look them up again. We will also 
try to have the recordings ready in a couple of days, and they will also be uploaded to the website of Agora Energiewende, as well as to the website of the embassy. And um, in case you're interested in the uh, work of uh, Agora Energiewende and Agora Industry, you're welcome to register for our newsletter. And if you're interested in other parts of this webinar or event series, which is um, conducted by the embassy, then um, our recommendation is to visit their website to check up um, once the next uh, events are online. Um, thank you again to the audience, to the whole panel, and I wish everyone a good rest of the day, evening, night, whatever the time zone is that you're in, and um, goodbye. Bye. Right. And I'll just leave, the, leave this on for a few seconds so the audience okay. isn't kicked out so quickly. But if you like, you can already switch off your cameras now on the panel. Right. And now I will make the big cut. Bye bye.